Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Bob Elson. We're set as usual for our Saturday afternoon show. Things are really quieted down in the world of sports with football all over now. There's still basketball, of course, and DePaul is right up there in the forefront. It's great that uh, Ray Myers' team is rated number one in the nation. But the thing about uh, that I'm always happy when football ends is that baseball is just around the corner. And believe me, that is my favorite dish. I really love baseball, and I really enjoy it just as much as when I broadcast the games for some 40 years. We're going to talk baseball today with an old friend, Roland Heeman, the vice president of the White Sox and a real good baseball man and a very nice man. So he'll be our guest today, and he'll be with us in just about one minute. We're delighted to have Roland Heeman as our guest today. He and I have been friends for a long, long time. He's a good baseball man, and of course everybody knows of my interest in baseball and my association with it for so many years. And uh, it culminated, fortunately for me, as you know, Roland, with uh, being honored by getting into the Hall of Fame, which to me was one of the great honors of my life. Well, very deserved. Deservedly so also. As a matter of fact, the other night I was up in Appleton, Wisconsin at a baseball banquet. It was the Red Smith uh, Annual Awards Dinner, and George Conner of football fame was there. And your name came up, and he, he, he was saying how delighted he was that you were now inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame, and he expressed the same way I feel, and all of your fans, that it was well-deserved, and we're delighted for you. Well, thank you. By the way, was Red Smith there? No, unfortunately, th- Red did pass on a couple of years ago in uh, Toledo, Ohio. But uh, his wife Lorraine was there, and his daughter, and uh, it was attended by some 1,200 people, and it was a very, very nice affair. Well, now you're certainly interest now. I guess 12 months a year, your interest is baseball, right? Solely baseball. When you say one sport season ends, ours is now getting close. Baseball, but. Uh, Baseball is a 12-month uh, situation with us. Uh, matter of fact, I was down in Mexico and saw a couple of baseball games there in Hermosillo, Mexico, where we have some players participating in winter league play just about three weeks ago. But our uh, White Sox will be reporting to Sarasota, Florida very soon. Our battery men show up on the 25th of February to start their training, and then the rest of the squad will join uh, forces on March the 3rd, and uh, Tony La Russa will get things going for us, and we're all looking forward to it. Did you run into Frank Lane in Mexico? I missed him this time. I, he was too far south. He was in Acapulco at the time that I was <laughs> in the Mexican Pacific part uh, towards Guaymas and Las Mochas and in that area. He's working now for San Diego, right? Yes. Uh, Frank's career continues uh, on and on. Uh, he was instrumental in helping the California Angels win the divisional championship this year with some of the recommendations he made for trades in recent years. And now he's joined Ray Kroc and the San Diego, San Diego Padres. Well, usually he gets in here right about this time and parks at the Bismarck Hotel. Well, Chicago is still his favorite city. And uh, I understand that he took the job with San Diego with the same stipulations that he could make Chicago his headquarters in the summer because it enables him to see the Chicago White Sox and the American League clubs at Comiskey Park and then the Cubs and the National League clubs as they come in uh, so uh, it's a fine place for him to judge the ball players from either, either league, and uh, we always enjoy his company, and we're thrilled, Bill Veck and I, and the rest of us at Comiskey Park when he comes by and visits with us. Was last year a disappointing year for the White Sox? Did you people figure to do better? Did you expect to do better? Well, you always go into every season optimistically. Uh, we had uh, a young ball club, and we knew an inexperienced one, and this is where uh, we think our enthusiasm and our optimism for 1980 is well-founded because a year ago you would recall that uh, we were talking about some left-hand pitchers who were coming up through the farm system and we're just coming out of the minor leagues such as uh, Ross Baumgard and Richard Wortham and Steve Trout, but they were untested at the major league level. Now they all have one successful year behind them in the majors. They now believe and know they can pitch up here and they proved it. And uh, so that certainly solidifies our forces as we open the season uh, to go along with Ken Kravick, who uh, might be considered the ace of the staff at the moment because of his uh, seniority. And then uh, what we were able to accomplish in midseason uh, when we made a couple of trades that we feel strengthened our ball club. Uh, we were able to get uh, Ed Farmer, a relief pitcher from Texas, who was expendable at Texas to, since they had Jim Curran and Sparky Lyle. But Farmer did a superb job for us the rest of the year. 
And then uh, we made a trade with the Philadelphia Phillies where we got second baseman Jim Morrison from their minor leagues from Oklahoma City, and he instantaneously improved our strength both defensively and offensively. Is there, or am I wrong in this assumption, is there a natural shortage of top catchers in the big leagues? Yes, but I guess the... You know, we look back through the years, and we remember Cochran and Hartnett and Dickey, but I guess as I was a Red Sox fan in the uh, late 30s and the 40s, it always seemed like we were looking for a catcher there in Boston. So uh, that is a position that there never seems to be enough top-flight catchers to go around for the 26 major league clubs. Well, outside of that, I remember having Paul Richards on a show a few years ago, and uh, I asked him, in your opinion, and if you could have just what you want, what is an ideal pitching staff? He said, I'd like to have six left-handers. <laughs> well, Paul Richard heads our player procurement and development side, and I guess he's accomplishing this feat. This is uh, phenomenal on our ball club, the uh, streak of good luck, or I must say uh, the astuteness of our scouts to have discovered some fine young left-hand pitchers. I mentioned Wortham and Baumgarten and Trout and Kravick, but we have others. Uh, Guy Hoffman from Ottawa, Illinois, who made it to the major leagues in a hurry. We have a 19- or 20-year-old youngster now, Britt Burns, who can really throw and will be at our major league camp. Uh, we signed a local boy uh, who came to Comiskey Park at a tryout camp just two years ago, and he'll be at our major league training camp, Kevin Hickey. And uh, then we have another one, Richard Barnes, who a lot of people compare to Brick Burns. So we have a wealth of left-hand pitching, which is uh, out of the ordinary. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, we're ordinarily a left-hand pitcher. It's a tremendous break for him to try to make a ball club. In our case, the right-hand pitchers uh, who have talent uh, have a real good chance of making a club because we're more left-handed. Roland, what about somebody to hit the ball out of the ballpark? Well, uh, Chet Lemon has good power, but he uh, he's an a- he hits for average as well as with power. Uh, we've got a youngster that is joining, uh, will be at his first major league training camp by the name of Harold Baines. He's from Eastern Shore, Maryland, who's been in the organization only two and a half years, but we regard as a very fine potential uh, power hitter. Uh, he has not uh, filled out completely yet. He reminds me a lot of Oscar Gamble, but he will hit with power and will hit for average, and we think we have a coming star. Our guest today, and we're delighted to have him, is an old friend, Roland Heeman, vice president of the Chicago White Sox. We'll be back with our guest in just a moment. We're talking baseball today with Roland Heeman, and it's uh, quite appropriate because Tonight is the annual Baseball Writers Dinner, and that's the tip-off, isn't it, Roland, that baseball is right around the corner? That really launches the baseball season in Chicago. Uh, White Sox and Cubs fans will congregate at the Palmer House and uh, uh, shake hands and meet the uh, honorees, and uh, we're proud of the fact that Ross Baumgarten, our left-hander, is being honored as the rookie left-hander here in Chicago, or rookie this year, along with uh, Scott Thompson of the of the Cubs and uh, Lamar Johnson, our big first baseman, receiving the Ken Hubbs Award in memory of Kenny Hubbs, uh, who was uh, tragically uh, involved in an airplane crash many years ago, but who had made his mark as a very fine young man in the community. As you uh, look around over the ball club, what about the ball club for speed and defense? Well, we uh, are going to look at the Alan Bannister at shortstop once again. He uh, underwent arm surgery about 15 months ago, and we knew last year was the recuperative time, and he was able to perform uh, adequately in left field, but the arm was mending. And then in the fall, he went to the instructional league, and uh, there was a, an undoubtedly very fine marked improvement of his throwing arm. So uh, he's a shortstop by trade, and it will be nice to look at him there again, and hopefully his throwing arm will be uh, along the lines as it once was when he uh, played at Arizona State and then was coming up through the Phillies organization. And uh, if he can accomplish that, of playing shortstop uh, and win the job, then that lends a great deal to our ball club because then that means we can add some other outfielder uh, out there who presents represents yeah. speed, uh, maybe Baines or Bosley or whoever it might be that can win the job and left. So I think we will find a, a faster ball club if Bannister can make it a shortstop. Who will be at third? Well, Kevin Bell just came off a very fine winter in the winter Puerto Rican league. He was playing for Frank Robinson, who was, was managing a Santurce club. 
and I've talked to Frank Robinson on numerous occasions this winter about uh, Kevin's play, and it seems that he has now regained all of the confidence that he had prior to the severe knee injury he had two years ago, and uh, he was a standout there, and Frank uh, Robinson has no doubt that uh, Kevin Bell should be our everyday third baseman. Frank was quite a ball player, wasn't he? Well, I was glad that Kevin Bell could play under him because uh, Frank was a great ball player, a tremendous hitter, uh, one who stood just on top of the plate, never budged, got knocked down a lot and got hit by pitches, but he always came back. It was one of the finest clutch hitters I ever saw. How do you visualize at this early date the strength in the division that you're in? Well, we're excited and enthusiastic. Uh, we played against the best the division could uh, provide against us the last couple of months. Uh, you remember when Tony La Russa took over the ball club on uh, August the 3rd, uh, we had to play some of the very cream crops of both divisions, matter of fact, Baltimore, New York, Boston, Milwaukee, and then we played California, and, and I was so proud of our ball club. We went to Anaheim, and we scored 32 runs, and they scored 32 runs in a uh, in a three-game, four-game series, uh, averaging eight runs a game, both clubs tooth and nail, and, and they managed to win three, but they were three of the toughest losses that we ever suffered uh, and uh, I'm not uh, one who normally complains publicly about umpire, but I tell you, that was one series they ate my heart out uh, because there were plays where I remember Bobby Gritch bouncing off uh, high catcher Mike Colburn flying over home plate. The umpire's calling him safe, and then Gritch is coming back, diving back, knowing he missed the plate, but he called him safe a second time, so Colburn's tagged him about four times. He's still <laughs> called safe, you know, and then at the end of the night, you beat 10-9. to nine. And I tell you, Tony LaRusso and I, we stayed in that clubhouse. We didn't leave till three o'clock in the morning, just uh, crying in our beer, you might say, because uh, it was a real heartbreaking loss. But the, the club showed real character, and uh, I could tell the guys were saying, "Wait till we get California in Comiskey Park next week." And the following week, they came in and we knocked Nolan Ryan out of the box. I say we, the ball players did, in the first inning with the five spot, and they never caught us. And the second day, we knocked. Uh, Chris Knapp out of the box with six in the first inning. So we got our just revenge. But I think that's when the club really came of age as a young club coming down the stretch. And then we played Minnesota. They were still in a race, and they had beaten us seven straight times. So they were going for a sweep of the season, so they thought. But instead, we reversed the tables, beat them the last five times, knocked them out of the race. So uh, I, the club showed real comeback character, and I think that's indicative that as we go into this coming season, the other clubs better beware. Roland, I've always had a feeling, and maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong in it, but I've always had a feeling that Nolan Ryan is way overrated. For the kind of money he gets, uh, say he'll strike out 16, he'll walk 17. Uh, his one and loss record, it doesn't make him a great pitcher. They talk about him and Sandy Koufax. He couldn't carry Koufax's shoes. No, Ryan has not been the winner that, that a Koufax and some of the other great pit, pitchers, and I... I have to agree with you that great pitching goes with winning, and his percentage doesn't uh, belies his talents. It's just that he is, at certain times, have had some phenomenal ball games because he has one of the greatest arms uh, that I've ever seen. But that doesn't make you great if you don't get the results. And uh, uh, despite the fact that he has left the California Ball Club, uh, we our, our club through the years has had pretty good success against him. But I guess that has held true with other clubs where if you're just around 500 as a pitcher, you win one, you lose one. But at the end, there are other pitchers who do far better with less. Well, one of the things that hurts Ryan is his wildness. I mean, you could start a start a ball game and walk the first two men. you got two men on and nobody out. I mean, he, he's so wild. That, uh... Yeah, it's, well, sometimes I guess he has difficulty harnessing that good stuff of his and he can't contain his fastball and keeping his strike zone as it moves so well. But Koufax found a way. It took him a while to uh, put it together. But when he did, uh, for a stretch of time, he was just almost unhittable and with fine control. Who would you say is the best left-hander and the best right-hander you've seen? See if they match me. You've just mentioned the left-hander. Well, uh, Koufax, for that yeah. short four or five-year period, I guess you couldn't be any better. Naturally, I have my prejudices because sometimes where you've been associated with a particular player for a number of years, uh, you've seen him perform under all sorts of circumstances. But Warren Spahn has to go for me because I was with the Boston Braves organization, Milwaukee Braves, and he helped us win championships. So. You know, you can't believe it. If you take a book and you look at Warren Spahn's record, it just bears out what you say. 
He really had a fantastic record. Yeah, he was still winning 20 ball games and he was past 40 years old. And he didn't win his first major league game till he was 25 or 26 because he had been in a world war. So uh, there's no telling with the four additional years what he, he would have written records that uh, never to be broken by. Pretty good hitter, too. That's it. He was uh, he, he could hit. He could run, he could slide, he could feel his position. He won ball games every conceivable way. So, and, and you could just count on him. And he, he just took his regular turn day in, you know, every fourth day. And uh, he'd have knee operations. It's it's amazing. He wouldn't even let the ball club know, and he'd have it done after the season. And then he'd make sure to show up in condition to where no one was aware, and you find out three or four years later that he had a knee operation. So it shows his competitive yeah. spirit and his ability. He was something. What about a right-hander? Well. Maybe I was impressionable uh, at a younger age, uh, but in, I saw a game in 1940 with Bob Feller throwing, and I thought oh, this is the man. epitome of the greatest pitcher that I could ever hope to see, and I think he was. Yeah. I agree with you. I thought Feller was the best right-hander I ever saw. You know, Feller had an attitude that he never thought anybody should get a hit off him. Remember the way he used to stomp off the mound? Yeah, he, he had some showmanship huh? about him. He stuck that big chest out at you and came firing at you and kicked that high kick. And then when he came up with that great curveball that just fell off the table to go along with that great fastball, uh, uh, I, I'm sure it wasn't any fun for hitters to know that the following day fellow was scheduled to pitch. But the game that I well recall that on that day when I thought I saw the greatest pitcher I ever saw was he pitched against Boston. Rudy York hit one in the center field bleachers. For, it was only a two-hitter. But I, I, I'd have to believe he shut his eyes, swung as hard as he could, and happened to make contact. <laughs> you remember that famous Rudy York home run at Sox Park? No, I don't. I wasn't uh, here to... Maybe you weren't. Well, Rudy York was batting, and it was a very close game. I think we were in the extra innings. I think it was the 10th inning. And I mentioned on the broadcast, I said, if Rudy York had hit a home run now, I'll send everybody a turkey. <laughs> that was an expensive home run. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I no sooner got it out of my mouth than he parked the ball in the upper deck. <laughs> and that's the last time you promised turkeys, I'm sure. <laughs> well, brother, did we get mail and uh, bills for turkey dinner and turkey luncheons and so on and so forth that we really didn't know what to do. Well, we finally decided that uh, we'd get an attractive cardboard turkey, and he'd autograph it and I'd autograph it, and we sent it out to everybody, and everybody was satisfied. Well, I figured you'd think of something. <laughs> like Charlie Dressen used to say, keep it close, you'll think of something. Well, you sure did that time. Beautiful. Yeah, that, re that really worked out fine. Well, the season is almost upon us. What about the balance in your division? Well, we think that we can compete. Uh, we're not making great noises about it. We'd rather sneak up on them. But uh, California, uh, they have a fine ball club and a lot of hitting. Yeah, Kansas City is always tough. Uh, Minnesota, Gene Mark gets great mileage out of all of his ball clubs. Texas Rangers, they have good all-around ability. But when it's all done, uh, I think we'll be right there battling with the leaders. Did Nolan Ryan go to Texas? Yeah, he was the Houston Ball Club uh, for uh, a tremendous sum of money uh, as far as contract is concerned for himself. Uh, they try to replenish the loss of uh, of of. Ryan by uh, signing Bruce Keeson from the Pittsburgh Ball Club in re-entry draft. Well, the season uh, will be here before you know it, and it's a nice feeling, isn't it? Well, it's what about come. preparation for you and Bill Vec? What are you fellows doing now? I know you're thinking baseball and talking baseball. Well, as I praise the players, I also sometimes have to be a little cautious because I also have to sign them. <laughs> so we're negotiating contracts with the players and their agents. Uh, uh, where we go over the players that have participated in winter ball, uh, get the scouting reports so to find out if some of them have improved sufficiently to count on them maybe to a higher level than we might have at the end of last season. Uh, our trainer, uh, our doctors close, keep close tabs on our players uh, for mending problems for injuries they might have had last year. Uh, we keep close tabs on their diets and training programs and uh, spring training is right close by and uh, uh, Tony LaRusso comes into the office often to discuss things with Bill, uh, thinking about extra games to schedule in the mornings uh, to make sure that all of our players in camp get the uh, ample opportunities to make the club. So uh, there are a lot of discussions that go on uh, preparatory to any season. What about Tony's background? Now, he's the new manager. He's a bright young manager. I'm very, very much impressed with him, and I think he'll 
go on to be one of the best managers in the game. Uh, Tony has prepared himself to be a manager for some time. It's very evident. He talks about that when he broke in with the Kansas City Bar Club, uh, Jimmy Dykes was one of the coaches and how much uh, he would spend hours with Jimmy talking baseball and how impressed he was with Jimmy. Uh, also, Tony comes from Tampa, Florida, and one of his close friends and a man that he's admired for many, admired for many years and spends a great deal of time during the off season with him is Al Lopez, the senor. So he's had some good uh, training or discussions with tremendous baseball men and uh, he has a very brilliant mind. As a matter of fact, I'm so proud of the fact that just recently he passed the bar exams in Florida, so now he's a full-fledged lawyer as well as being a, a big league manager, which is a tremendous achievement to have accomplished this, uh, uh, undergoing studies uh, during the off season. So I think the Chicago White Sox fans will thoroughly enjoy yeah. this young man. Well, now, with, with just about the same talent as you had last year, you finished fifth, right? Yes, but... Uh, Tony took over the ball club on August the 3rd, and uh, we were we were really struggling. And we ended up 14 games under 500, but during the period of time that he managed, we played 500 baseball. So that was very encouraging. He has great knowledge of all the players throughout the organization, having managed in the farm system and, and coached uh, two years ago half of the season with the Major League Club. Uh, so that uh, uh, no none of the players on the club uh, is foreign to him, and uh, he relates well to the uh, present day athlete. Uh, I think he motivates very well. He's a good judge of talent. Uh, he's good running a ball game. So uh, with all this hand in hand, I think it's going to be a highly spirited and hustling ball club, and one that uh, Tony will get the very best out of. Roland, are there going to be any changes in baseball this year, rule wise or anything else? No, there are. Uh, there are always some discussions of possible changes, but uh, the National League continues to see fit to continue with the pitcher hitting in the ninth spot, and the American League continues with the doesn't they hit a rule, and there's been no change in that regard. Uh, but the, uh, the game will be played uh, in the same manner as last year as far as rules are concerned. Sometimes you really wonder why with two major leagues and uh, they play in a World Series that there is such a single radical departure is the one you just mentioned, the business of the pitcher or the designated hitter. Uh, the commissioner has the power to change that, doesn't he? Yes, but it's it's a decision that he has chosen not to uh, make. Uh, uh, of He has made it for the World Series. It's alternating years. I know the American League would like, if the commissioner would change it, that both leagues would use a designated hitter rule. The National League, uh, probably not having thought about it first, uh, through tradition that uh, tries uh, to uh, continue their league in the way in which they have handled it, although I know that there is sentiment among some of the National League clubs uh, to have the designated rule, but they don't get enough votes to put it in. Now, spring training gets underway when? February 25th will be our battery men. We'll play our first exhibition game on March the 11th uh, and uh, then we open the season here at Comiskey Park on April the 10th. On April the 10th. What's that, a Tuesday? I believe it's a Thursday, and it's against the American League champions, Baltimore Orioles. So Will Weaver and uh, his pitching staff of uh, Flanagan and Palmer and McGregor, who... Uh, <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> yes, but uh, we had some tremendous games in Baltimore, some 2-1, to 12-inning ball games last year uh, against them, so... Uh, we might as well play them early as late. Yeah, I think the Sox played better against Baltimore than any team. They gave Baltimore a terrific battle. Yeah, we seem to rise uh, to the occasion, uh, uh, but they were very tough to beat. Earl Weaver always seems to find one way somehow to win a ball game that seems to be within our grasp, but uh, we have played extremely good ball against them. Are the Yankees going to dominate anything? Uh, really, I, I don't expect them to. I, I think Baltimore will probably repeat in the American League East uh, with Boston being a strong contender. Uh, the Yankee ball club uh, has added age in the unfortunate loss, uh, the passing of Thurman Munson. It was a severe blow, which is very, very difficult to overcome. And uh, Peniella is getting older, and uh, Roy White now is going to buy the... Uh, the end of his career or possibly signing with another club and re-entry. But uh, as a club, Greg Nettles about 36 or 37 now at the, at third base, so age is creeping up on them rapidly. They're not the kind of a great Yankee club that you and I saw at one time, remember? 
<laughs> I can remember some of these. Every decade, they'd come up with one just as good as the previous one. But when you look back at the DiMaggio, Joe DiMaggio and Center and Charlie Keller and Tommy Henrik, and then, you know, just, Blue well, you Berry. saw it all through the years. Yeah, you, you saw it during the Greenberg and, and uh, not Greenberg, but Gehrig and uh, Ruth days. I missed that era, and uh, I wish I would have seen them in action. Just imagine those two guys coming up back to back. They were really something. You know the difference in the way they hit? No, I, I didn't. Not having seen them, I... Well, they both were home run hitters, as you know, and both hit a lot of home runs. Gary always hit line drives, or usually, and Ruth had hit them two miles up in the air. You know, the ball had looked like a pea going out in the upper deck. And it just kept carrying. Huh? Yeah. Phenomenal. But they were they were fantastic. Yeah, I'd like to come up with a twosome like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the White Sox would be in pretty good shape. Well, it'll be here now, uh, as you mentioned, uh, before we know it. The sooner the better, at least the sports pages now, and uh, I begin in the carry baseball, which is always a, an in indication that it's not far off. And uh, it, every year, and I, I, I enjoy chatting with you because I know that uh, your great love and enthusiasm for the game never wanes, and I feel the same way about this great game, Fowers. Well, I do, too. I'm going to see you at the Baseball Writers' Dinner tonight. Yeah, I look forward to that tonight, Bob, and uh, I look forward to being, so, spending nice more time with you. Thank you. Thank you, Roland, for being with us. Our guest today, and we've been delighted to have him and to talk baseball with Roland Heeman, vice president of the White Sox and a real good baseball man. And baseball will be here before you know it. Have a happy day, and now this is Bob Elson saying goodbye until next Saturday at our usual time.